this morning. I'm glad I'm here with you and that you're here with, uh, with us. It's really great to see you. Um, and we're going to start with the prayer, and then we're going to talk again about God's view on women. So, Lord, we're thankful that we can gather here together with you um, and with each other. Uh, Lord, we know that, uh, God, you're always with us. Um, your presence is always with us every day, um, residing within us, as the Apostle Paul tells us. And, uh, Lord, we pray that you would um, help us and guide us in our lives um, as you see fit, uh, as we walk each day uh, to manifest who you are. Uh, and, Lord, that is of utmost importance, um, I understand, and I hope that you would continue working in us um, as believers in you uh, and your Son, and let that shine through us in the world. Amen. So, we've been talking about women and what God's view of women is, um, how he made women, um, what their standing is in the scriptures, in the Bible, um, in God's mind. And uh, we can see that showing through throughout the Old Testament we've been looking at, even though the prevailing view among men in society um, was that women had a certain place. And we saw uh, to begin with, that men and women both had a certain place. That though today we might look at back then, we thought people thought of women as property. In reality, everybody in the tribal unit or family was property. They just all had their roles to play um, in the culture of that time. And so today I want to um, start moving towards the New Testament. Uh, to start moving towards the New Testament, um, we had to look at the Old Testament because some of those views um, are going to start to become more prevalent as we get to Jesus' time. The view that uh, women were subservient or had a certain place because something started to change and shift. And I want to start with something written by a man named Gordon Fee. Now, he is a scholar. He is a professor of New Testament at the Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, and I've read some things, I've never read anything by him, but in, sometimes in my studies, his name pops up and they have some things for it. So I recognize his name and this was kind of neat and it's about culture. He says culture, uh, culture in general, and then he says here's some assumptions. The word culture is sometimes used in a way that suggests there is an oughtness um, or a way things should be. Because in uh, um, the word, Microsoft Word says oughtness is not a real word, but it's got quotations around it. In oughtness to culture. But that is an illusion. Culture simply is. Culture is not a matter of how things should be. Culture is what defines us. We do not define it. We simply do the best we can to try and describe it. Indeed, until recent times, culture was not even a subject of discussion because it was simply assumed. I thought, wow, that's pretty interesting because that's not, as he says, how we try to define things or describe things. We like to think that we define the culture. We set the culture. The culture happens because we make it happen. But he's saying that when we think that way, that's an illusion. That's because we want to control and feel like we have control over something. But what he's saying is that culture just happens. And we, in our culture, become defined as human beings. We don't set the culture. And last week I said something about, you know, my formative years as a human being was in the 80s, right? And I remember growing up in the 80s and hearing people saying, oh, it wasn't like that when I was a kid, or it shouldn't be that way, or, you know, we're getting away from this and that. But according to here, we were getting away from whatever we had in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s because the culture was shifting or changing. 
And so I was being defined the way I think now even, I recognize much of the things I believe or think were because of those years when I was a certain age and those are the things that were impressed upon me. And now some of those things are different. Do I have control over that? None. And if I try to have control over that, then according to Mr. Fee, I'm living an illusion because there isn't a right way or oughtness. Now, of course, there are basic premises of being a human being that should always remain the decency and love, but the rest of it, we don't have any. It changes, so if you start thinking about it, it changes necessarily based on the things that continually define humanity. Now, this is my own thoughts on what he just said. What changes the culture? Economies. How much control do I have, me, over economies? Nothing. All I can do every day is get up, get in my car, and go to work. And make money, and I spend money based on what I'm, I fall into it. Everybody says, oh, you fall into the machine. Of course I do. We all do. If we didn't, then Amazon wouldn't be one of the greatest, largest companies in the world. And I work with people who, some people will say, I never buy anything from Amazon because I'm, it's against my principle. And I'm like, I love it. Because they have everything. Everything. It's amazing. Economies, world powers. I don't have any control over that either. Wars. The state of the environment around us. If all of a sudden there's a period of huge hurricanes happening all the time, we have no control over that. That's Mother Nature. Does that change cultures? Yeah, it does change the culture in many ways, whether we want it to or not. Availability of food and water, agriculture, technological advancements, sanitation, disease, how we use the resources on the earth or when we discover new resources that we can use or when a resource disappears, it changes the culture. Helium, I never knew this. I learned this because of my job, because we like to use balloons to celebrate things, right? It used to be, if I wanted some balloons, I just went to a certain department and got some balloons out of the drawer and filled them up with the tank. And then one time, several years ago, someone in that department said, no, you guys have to pay for that. And I'm like, what do you mean? Well, your department has to transfer it. We have to take that into account. And I'm like, it's helium. Well, helium, as it turns out, is a rare earth mineral. And guess what? It's running out. Amazing. It comes out of rocks. And some of the places where helium comes from is it's not producing it anymore. And helium is used in MRI machines and other medical equipment because it's an extremely efficient coolant. And when those magnets are running around taking pictures of your body, they're generating incredible amounts of heat. And the helium cools them more than anything else could possibly cool them. Pretty amazing, huh? So now helium is running out. So when you go get helium balloons, it's more expensive. So is that a cultural thing? Maybe. Maybe there's less celebrations of helium balloons. I don't know. But that's just an example of resources in the earth. How many children are born? How long human beings live? And what humans believe? Culture evolves. So something started happening in the Bible. We had tribal people. And then if you just look at Israel, they wanted a king. And what does a king do? Consolidates the power, consolidates the wealth, and up pops a city. Now in the Bible, cities were around since the days of Cain, right? Cain made a city. But as I said a few weeks ago, that city was nothing like we imagine it. It was a city to 
a bunch of people spread out in tribes because all of a sudden a bunch of them lived together and had a few houses. That was their city. And when David comes along, the king, he makes a city, Jerusalem, which is already there, right? It was Salem at one time, and it becomes Jerusalem, and it grows and it expands. But if you look at archaeology, the size of Jerusalem when David was king was nothing. But it was a city, and it brought tribes close to it because there were resources. There was a legal system. There were people to enforce the legal system. It was safer. They had walls that you could live in and not have to worry about invaders, other tribes that were invading people. As the cities became more populous and more frequent, then the tribes started going to the cities. They still, still might have lived in the rural areas and been tribal but they relied more on the city and the city relied more on them. And so what happened? The culture changed. It started to shift and change. People had to change with it because if they didn't change with it, then they got left behind and they weren't able to live with the culture, to absorb from the culture. God had a mind toward women that suddenly, as the culture shifted, started to change. God's mind didn't change women, I'm sorry. The culture and the mind of men in the culture started to change about women because the men weren't willing to shift with the culture, women in their mind in the tribe had a certain place. So when the city became something and men gathered more power and more control, they started taking women and relegating them to only certain tasks where they could speak, where men could speak and men could drive the economy and men could do things. Women weren't brought along with that, even though in God's mind, women were complementary. So as the culture shifted, even in the Jewish societies leading up to and after uh, Jesus and the Twelve and Paul did not change. There is something they sought and said, there's a certain oughtness to culture that women fit in and we have to keep them there. There were some women in the Old Testament, and we're not going to go to them all because we want to continue moving. But let's talk about Ruth for a second. Ruth lived in the time of Judges. So even though the book of Ruth takes place a little, you know, afterwards, it's next to it because she actually was born in the time of the Judges, in another culture, in another country. If it was, we could say a country, it wasn't bordered, but another group of people, the Moabites. She was a Moabite. She goes to Judah and becomes the wife of Boaz because her husband, who is a Jewish man, passes away, right? And she's with Naomi, her mother-in-law, who is a Jewish woman living outside of uh, the Jewish area or where most of the Jewish tribes live. Uh, and she, Naomi says, well, I'm going to go back home. And Ruth follows, right? We know that story. Ruth follows. This places Ruth, a Moabite, what's going to happen in the story, into the ancestral line of Jesus. And being a Moabite was, I think it, placed, it could place on Ruth, if people knew she was a Moabite, a little danger. Because what happened in Judges? Well, the Moabites were oppressing the Israelites, and a certain judge named Ehud, which I always thought was a cool story, he's raised up, and he goes to talk to the king of the Moabites, and what does he do? Does anybody remember? He has a knife, a sword, a short sword, and he attaches it in his leg. And when he goes in, he says to the king, I have something to tell you. And the king sends all his servants out, and what happens? Ehud takes the sword out, and as he's getting closer to the king to tell him, he runs him through. 
And the story of the king is so large, the sword gets lost inside of him, gets sucked in. And then when he's sitting there, the, the, his servants later on find him, right? And then the Israelites are able to defeat the Moabites, and they have peace again. I think it's for another 40, it might be longer than 40, it might be 80 years after Ehud, but they have some time. But Ruth is from the enemy, and she comes back to live with them. And I think that reveals a huge truth going all the way back to Genesis 12 that God is going to bring something out of the line of Abraham that blesses all people, not just Israel. And God inserts people like Ruth into the family line to say, it's not just from you, Israel. There's also someone else in that line that I'm going to bless. Moabites, right? Everybody. So Ruth does something that's outside of what women should be doing in the tribal system. What should have Ruth done? Stayed home with her family. Who would support her? And then find somebody for her, and she could live among the Moabites. But instead she left. Esther sways a man a king, and reveals to the king who she is so that the king wouldn't go along with Haman and kill all of the Israelites. She hides her identity uh, because she's married to the Persian king, and she doesn't want anybody to know that she's a Jew, so it's hidden, and she lives there. This is King um, Ahasuerus who, of course, is considered a Gentile because he's a Persian. And the Persians have what over the Israelites? The Israelites are captive, right? But she's there, and she marries a Persian king, which would be forbidden that she would marry outside of her family, her tribe, outside of the Israelites, with a Gentile. So she is already outside of what she should be doing, right? But she does. And what's funny is, you know, we read Ezra and Nehemiah took place at the end, right? We think of Malachi as the end. Malachi is just the last of the minor prophets. And that's how our Bible's laid out. Not because Malachi was actually the end of the Old Testament. Ezra and Nehemiah are written about the people that came back and started the rebuild and stayed there. The people came back to the land, but most of the people did not come back to the land. But the people of Ezra and Nehemiah are told that they need to get rid of all their wives and all the children and all the women that came from mixed marriages. Yet, it's Esther in a mixed marriage with a king that makes it even possible for Ezra and Nehemiah to go back. That's pretty interesting, isn't it? I've always wondered about that situation where they had to get rid of all the wives, people that lived and had a family and had children all of a sudden, oh, you have to get rid of them, right? But here's Esther who didn't do that. And it's because of her that they're even able to do that. Today, they still celebrate in Israel, current Israel, or Jewish people even here, celebrate Esther in a certain festival. And in that festival, they all wear uh, masks, it's like a masquerade party, because Esther hid herself and who she was. And then she reveals who she is to save everyone, right? And I guess during the festival, they mentioned the name Haman, kind of like I, th I thought about it, kind of like we ding our glasses at a wedding so the couple can kiss. Well, some people just scream out Haman's name, and as soon as they scream it out, the whole crowd at the war, whoever's at the party, yells boos and hisses. That sounds fun, right? You mention someone's name and everybody goes, boo, hiss, because of Haman. So those are a couple more women in scripture, and there's some others you can read that stepped out of their roles and were used outside of the role of what uh, I think God is trying to say, 
This role was necessary for where you lived in your culture at your time. But your culture is changing. And so you need to change with your culture. And you need to view women differently in your culture. Because the way I view women in your culture was fine. Because it was necessary. But that's changing. And so God says, my view of women allows a woman to be in the culture and function in the culture with everyone else. And since the culture is changing, their function is going to be a little different. But we're going to see right now that there are some people who couldn't take that. They couldn't handle it. They're like, no. Right? We're going to define the culture. And the women in our culture have a certain role, and that's where they're going to stay. So during the captivity, around the time of Esther, probably sometime afterwards, or even happening while she was alive, the Jewish religion began to change by men that eventually turned out to be Pharisees and scribes and Sadducees and the Essenes. These groups became the Jewish leadership, and their leadership was very closely married to their religion. But they couldn't just have the religion or the Mosaic Law as it was. They had to change the Mosaic Law in order to meet the times of their culture. That's what they did. They didn't have to do that, but that's what they did. And it turned out that they did it so that they could have more control and interpret the Mosaic Law into the situations of modern life. Their modern life, not our modern life. They wrote history as they perceived, and it was handed down in oral form. In fact, many scholars, and I don't see, you know, I'm not a scholar, so I just read what different people write, but many scholars think that a lot of the Old Testament that we read now was actually penned down and written out in written form during these times um, of the, uh, I just lost the word, captivity. So, they perceive that there are certain things that should be according to them. Facts and opinions about many facets in life. And those included gender roles and where they were. So I'm going to read a few things from Pharisees, rabbis, teachers, scribes, and things that are written um, and what they thought. And this comes from an article called Attitudes Towards Women the rabbis versus Jesus. And then there's a, a couple other sources that I pulled some things from. Uh, I'm not going to read the names of the guys and where it comes from. If you ever want to know, you can ask me, but there are things from Midrash and different teachings. Um, some I've never heard from, but there are uh, teachings by Sanhedrins, um, certain people in the Sanhedrin. And the things I'm going to read all revolve around what they thought about women. And when we read these, we're going to understand how it was seen that Jesus was a radical when it came to women. The first one is, the female is irrelevant in creation, as she is only like a leech, clinging to the main thing, a man, taken from it, a man, for its usage. She is made special for its usage, as one of his special parts for its own usage. It's terrible. This is written by a Jewish rabbi. So he says that a woman was created by God for a certain usage for men. That's it. Another one, this is a Sanhedrin quote, woe to him whose children are female. <laughs> Another one says, once Eve was created, Satan was created with her. Whoever teaches his daughter the Torah teaches her obscenity because they thought that women couldn't learn. They weren't good enough to learn, which makes sense because when the Pharisees and the rabbis had their ministries, were there women in them? No, just men. Another one, Rabbi Levi, Levi ben Gershon, Levi from Gershon, says she has no more qualities than animals, even if she has a brain. 
He also said she was created in order to serve. In the Middle Ages, because they still wrote in the Middle Ages, I know we always think there's the Dark Ages, right? They weren't really the Dark Ages, as I find out, as the more I learn about things. Uh, but we consider them that, the Middle Ages. He says that a woman would be available at age 12 to give birth and have children, which is not crazy because in those days it was, right? People didn't live that long. It said, the husband should prevent this and not allow his wife to leave the house any more than once or twice a month if needed, prevent a woman going out uh, into the world, since the beauty of a woman comes from sitting in the corner of her house. Just a couple more. Uh, this one says, therefore, the Ari Hakadosh, which is the title of someone uh, in a certain Jewish sect, um, would spit every time he saw a saucy woman. A saucy woman is a woman dressed saucily, so not in long gowns with head coverings and stuff, right? She had jewelry and ornaments and was making herself look really nice and probably spoke her mind too she was saucy it was considered a great virtue to spit when you saw such a woman another one said women should not be available to testify um, another one says do not speak excessively with women for all women's conversations are lewdness any woman who refuses to do one of the chores she is obligated to do is forced to do it even if by the rod. And it is uh, permissible, according to one rabbi, to starve women until they surrender as far as doing housework. If they weren't doing their housework, then you could withhold food from them. Anyways, I have a couple more. I'm not going to read them all. But you get the picture. Uh, you know, another source says rabbinic literature contains more explicit opinions about women it is said that women are greedy lazy and jealous but also more compassionate and more naturally intelligent than men so they have both sides it said women are associated with witchcraft and said to be foolish and dishonest but a man without a wife is said to be without joy and blessing so you need a wife but you need to keep her in her place basically These are the things that were written about women by the Jewish leadership that were not written in tribal days. In the tribal days, women were prized because they had a place in the system that worked in the system with everybody else. It was equal, right? We had men that were in charge, the patriarch, but in some stories in the Bible, we had matriarchs, a woman like Deborah, who took charge. Nobody went back after Deborah, after we read about her in Judges, and said, she shouldn't have done that. Nobody. She was praised for what happened. It wasn't until later in Scripture we saw where those, that situation was mentioned that Deborah's name was left out and Barak's name was there. Because why? Because when someone wrote that down at that period in time, they were already starting to start saying, wait a minute, we can't have her name in there. And you say, well, why would God allow that to happen in the Bible? Because God's trying to show you something. At one time, I chose Deborah, and she was awesome and did something that no one else was willing to do in Israel. And then later on, you foolish men were afraid. To put her name in there because of something you thought so jesus comes along and my next heading is jesus the feminist radical who wants to think of jesus as a feminist radical nobody does right in his time they wouldn't have used that term right and maybe jesus would say please don't call me that i was just trying to treat people, human beings, equally. But at the same time, Jesus was trying to make a point in his ministry about women. He often made it a point to include women 
in his ministry, in his stops where he landed as he was walking and teaching in different towns and areas in his ministry. It was surely something that made the rabbis and the Pharisees and the Sadducees angry with Jesus. So let's look at a couple verses in the New Testament, and we're going to be in the book of Luke primarily, and just begin to this week, and we'll continue next week, look at how women featured in Jesus' ministry. And eventually, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to get to Paul and some of the things he said in Ephesians and elsewhere about women. And we're going to learn why did Paul say those things? Because everything that we're going to be talking about for the next couple of weeks seems to say that Paul maybe should not have said those things. And maybe it's kind of weird that he says those things about women. But we're going to learn uh, why he might have said them the way he did. And it will make sense. So in Luke 8, in verses 1 through 3, we're going to read, Soon afterwards, he began going around from one city and village to another, proclaiming and preaching the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him. And also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and sickness, Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, other women, who were contributing to their support out of their private means. So three of these women were mentioned, and then it says there were others who were following Jesus everywhere he went, from village to village, doing what? Contributing to Jesus going out and preaching the gospel from their own private means. So first, there's Jesus, then the twelve, all the men are mentioned, but also some women. And he mentions three. And what about these three women? Well, one of them is kind of interesting. We'd say, well, Mary's interesting. She has seven demons. That's interesting, right? That's a great movie. A woman in a room crawling on the ceiling with a Catholic priest sprinkling holy water saying things, trying to get the demons to come out. No, Jesus didn't have to do that, did he? He just said, out you go, and out they went. They argued sometimes, but he got them out. The woman that's interesting is Joanna, because her husband is a steward of Herod. We all know who Herod is. He's the ruler of the province, placed by the Romans. He is a rich man, this Chusa. A steward of a ruler is rich. They're chosen because of their class in society to be this ruler or this steward. And Joanna, now the wife of the steward of Herod, is following Jesus, the upstart, the troublemaker, around Galilee from town to town, giving him money from her own private means. Where does her money come from? Chusa. I wonder how that looked on Chusa when he went to work every day. Oh, there's the guy. Where's his wife? Not at home cleaning. Nope. She's out in the countryside with another man, a group of men, taking his money and helping this guy go around and cause problems. That's what she did, well outside of her position. Did Jesus look at these ladies and say, now go back to your families and do what you're supposed to do? No. It says that they followed him from town to town, helping to support the ministry. So they did. Tom Wright, who I mention often, my dad mentions sometimes, great guy who's got some really neat stuff that he's written. This is what he writes. These women have done the unthinkable. They have left 
the well-defined social space of home and family where they had a role and a duty and have chosen to accompany Jesus and his followers on the road from place to place, looking after their needs and doing so, moreover, out of their own pockets. That must have made some people in the Jewish leadership scratch their heads and wonder, what is this guy doing? Right? Jesus is taking... You can't miss this. You can't just read over it. Jesus is taking women that their culture thinks should be in a certain place and allowing them to do something different, and in so doing, putting them on an equal plane. They're with me, traveling, helping, outside of their family. In, verse, in chapter 7 of Luke, in verses 36 to 39, it says, Now one of the Pharisees was requesting him, Jesus, to dine with him, and he entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. And there was a woman in the city who was a sinner. And when she learned that he was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house, she brought an alabaster vial of perfume. And standing behind him at his feet, weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears and kept wiping them with the hair of her head and kissing his feet and anointing them with, perf with the perfume. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who and what sort of person this woman is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. Now, this is a common story that you can hear all the time throughout the year at various churches and blogs and podcasts. And they talk about all kinds of things about the Pharisees tricking Jesus, knowing this woman was going to be there and allowing her to come in a house full of men. It wasn't just the Pharisee and Jesus. There were other Pharisees there. And that they let her do this and watch her do this so they could trick Jesus and say, you're not who you are because you're allowing a woman, and not only a woman, but one that is outside of her family, doing things that a woman shouldn't be doing, prostituting herself, a sinner, spending the money she makes on what Judas would say, ointments and wasting them when the money could be used for different things, right? The expectation is by them that Jesus should rebuke her for a sinner and being a woman and get her out. This is a house full of Pharisees, but he doesn't. He does the unthinkable to them, which is one of the reasons he is crucified because he forgives her sins. Who can forgive sins? God. So she's allowed to stay. Jesus lets her stay. He lets her do what he's doing. And of course, he's got things to say to them, which we're not going to uh, discuss today. But she does things that they couldn't even do. Over in Luke 10, in verse 39, there's a woman named Mary. A woman named Martha, I should say. She had a sister named Mary. It says, she had a sister, Martha, in verse 39, called Mary, who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. While Martha did what? Ran around the house, cleaning, preparing the food, getting everything ready, doing what a woman should do. What was Mary doing? Not what a woman should do. And it wasn't just because she wasn't working, right? It goes beyond that. She's sitting at Jesus' feet. When someone sits at a teacher's feet or a rabbi's feet or a Pharisee's feet, they're sitting there to learn. That's what men did. The rabbi stood in a place like this, and everybody else sat in front of him at his feet, and he taught. So she is well outside of her role. In, uh, in my Bible, it has a reference to this verse, which I found as I was studying it, uh, Acts 22.3. I'll just read it. In Acts 22.3, Paul is speaking. He says, I'm a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our 
fathers, being zealous for God, just as you are all today. Speaking to men, Jewish men. The reason this verse is connected to Luke 10, 39, is it 39? Yes, it is, 39, is because Paul, sitting under Gamaliel, would have been sitting down there at Gamaliel's feet, learning in order that he could do the same thing Gamaliel was doing, to be a Pharisee, a man sitting and learning. Women did not sit at men's feet to learn something. Why? Because she was going to stay at home. Jesus and all the guys were going to leave. And the women that were with them, who Martha probably thought really terribly of, they should be at their houses too. But Mary's sitting there like she was going to get up and leave with Jesus. Or get up and leave the house and go teach and preach the kingdom of God after sitting at the feet of Jesus and hearing and learning. So she was outside of her role. When Martha comes to Jesus and complains about it, Jesus is not insensitive to her feelings, but he tells her something that he tells other people. There's only one thing that matters, Martha. You're doing all this stuff, and it's great. And we're going to enjoy your food and your company and everything. But Mary's doing something. The one thing in life that matters over everything else. In Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, when they're all worried about what they're going to wear and eat and everything else, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what Mary was doing. Seeking the kingdom and his righteousness so that she could go out and preach the same thing. Seek the kingdom. In Matthew 19, three through six, you can go over there if you want. And I'm, Lisa, could you hand me my blue water bottle? If I just don't have a sip of water, I'm gonna have to stop talking because my mouth is dry. So I'm gonna take this designer water bottle that my dad mentioned. Thank you. It says, some Pharisees came to Jesus and testing him asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Jesus says, God made them male and female. He didn't make man up here and female down here. He made them female. And what happens when they get married? They're one. There's no separation. They're one unit, one being. And one unit, one being has no place of power or subservience over one or the other half. It doesn't. They're together. They're one. So what Jesus is doing right there, because the Pharisees are just, some of them, are just getting rid of their wives. For whatever reason. But there's only one reason, according to the law, that Moses wrote, that they can get rid of their wives, and that was for adultery. That was it. Other than that, you stayed married. And then Jesus is going to go on to say that actually... That was Moses' law. That wasn't God's law. God let Moses put that in the law because he knew that you were all going to want to divorce your wives. Because God knew that you all men were going to have a certain viewpoint of women. 
And so God said, in his mind, there's never going to be a separation. They're going to come together and be one unit, together, complementing each other. One is going to fill what the other lacks. And they're going to go through life as a, in a relationship that is extremely tight and won't fall apart. But I know, God says, that in their culture, there's a certain way they live. So God says, as Greg Boyd says, I'm going to stoop down to their culture so that I can work with them and let them have what they want. That's what Jesus just said to them. So no, Pharisee, you can't divorce your wife because you see a prettier young girl. You can't add to your family, to the wife you already have, because you see someone that you like better, who dresses better, who has nicer jewelry, or who cleans the house better than the one that you have. This is what you have. God made it a certain way. To be one, perfectly unified, a relationship not easily discarded, one relationship that needs both sides to survive. It would be like taking yourself and cutting yourself in half and throwing half of it away. Well, what happened to you? You would die. Physically, you can't survive. So God says, Adam, you need a woman. And he says to the woman, you need Adam. Two of you together are what it takes. That's equality. That's what Jesus is saying to them. It's not how they perceive the world, as we just read. The world is changing. It's becoming more urbanized. The culture is changing. There's an empire. The economy is different. Everything around them is going on, and they're worried and scared because our position is going to be lost. And they are, in some way, blaming it on women who are going out and getting jobs and doing different things and trying to make themselves like men. And the men are saying, no, we got to keep you where you're supposed to be. And Jesus is saying, no, you don't. They can get up. They can leave the house. They can follow me and support me financially and feeding and clothing and whatever else. Preaching and teaching like Mary wants to do. Jesus is saying, that's okay. That's okay. So, that's where we're going to stop today. And then we're going to see, uh, like I said, some things that Paul said and what, what that means. Amen.